Hi everybody and welcome back to the Malaria Dialogues. These are online discussions taking place in the lead up to the Malaria World Congress that's happening in Melbourne uh, at the beginning of July. So really just a few days away now. Uh, today our discussion uh, with two incredible guests focus on really putting malaria into a global health context and helping us to do that today. We have two very uh, senior and truly global health experts uh, the first is Dr. Sumya Swaminathan, who is the uh, Dr. Sumya is the uh, Deputy Director General for Programs at the World Health Organization in Geneva, and the second guest is Dr. Christoph Ben, who is the Director of External Relations at the Global Fund to Fight AIDS, TB, and Malaria, and they're both really going to be helping us uh, see malaria elimination in this broader global health context. So let's go let's go across to the discussion now. So after 15 years of fairly uh, remarkable progress against malaria, we're all hearing that uh, decreases in malaria are slowing, uh, moving backwards in some settings. Uh, where, where does this leave us? Uh, are we uh, an encouraging or a vulnerable point in the response to malaria? I would say it's, it's both, definitely both. Um, and we should not forget what has been achieved over the last 15 years to 18 years. Um, if we just look at the figures and recognize that malaria mortality has decreased by 60 percent since 2000. Mm -hmm. That's, you know, by all standards, uh, absolutely remarkable success story. Um, almost unprecedented in, in, in public health because you don't achieve 60 percent reductions in mortality in such a short period of time normally in a disease mm -hmm. that has been infecting countries people, you know, for, for centuries. So, that's certainly very encouraging, and that also means that we have the tools, um, you know, we have the instruments, we had improved tools, actually, better drugs, better insecticide-treated bed nets. Um, we've been, you know, distributing them. There has been much more financial resources for the control of malaria. So all of that has been very encouraging. Um, but it's absolutely true that now we are at a kind of um, particular point in time when we see that this progress has been stalling, um, meaning we are we are facing significant challenges. And um, at the moment, we are not on track to achieve the ambitious targets, um, which should lead us to end malaria as an epidemic by the year 2030 as part of the Sustainable Development Goals, but also the more short-term targets by 2020. And um, we urgently need to get back on track because you cannot make up for that. The, the, the period is short and people try to, you know, tend to forget that uh, 2030 is not that far away. There's been tremendous progress over the last 15 years or so in, in the fight against malaria all over the world. And we've seen, on the one hand, many more countries progressing towards elimination. Last year we had, I think, about 40 four or so countries that already reported less than 10,000 cases a year. And in fact, Paraguay last week has just been declared um, malaria free. So there is now, um, I think, a greater impetus and um, enthusiasm towards uh, the elimination and eradication agenda for malaria. But on the other hand, we have to grapple with the, with the fact that in 2016, the number of malaria cases, 216 million, was back to the 2012 uh, figures after having shown a decline. It's, it's in fact risen again a little bit. And we still have half a million deaths due to malaria. Um, majority of them, of course, in sub-Saharan Africa. And again, the coverage of bed nets has increased um, globally. The coverage of other interventions has increased. Um, the uptake of malaria diagnostics has gone up uh, considerably. And yet, you know, we're seeing a stalling of progress. And I think it's important for us to really, at this moment, examine the reasons for that um, mm -hmm. and plan very concrete actions to be able to overcome. Because it's clear that interventions at the current level have sort of uh, plateaued on the impact that right. they're having. 
and we 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 cannot sit back and wait for things to continue to improve because the signals are clear mm-hmm. that we need some additional interventions so right. so i would say that this year is actually quite uh, a sort of a year where um where important decisions have to be taken in the in the road map to malaria eradication mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. we are at a sort of crossroads and we could either step up the fight and 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 proceed according to plan or we let things drift because we we have seen um, globally the investments in malaria control plateauing as well right. so if that continues then you know there's a huge risk that we're going to start seeing an increase that that what we saw in 2016 would uh, would continue the, the upward trend so so i would say that we're really at a crossroads now and the world community needs to come together to decide um how they're going to proceed so you could say there are two major shifts happening in global health at the moment uh, that is the context for malaria elimination uh, one being the transitioning of countries away from so much dependence on international support um and more kind of uh, reliance on domestic finances priority setting and so on yeah. and the second one in the wake of the sdgs a uh, kind of recognition of uh, universal health coverage as the more as a kind of the 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 policy framework for malaria elimination and everything that's happening in health um what do you think is that you know the impact malaria can have the relationship on malaria elimination with those global shifts and vice versa how do those shifts help or uh, yeah influence malaria elimination yeah no you're right um there is this trend more towards domestic financing of of health um also in lower and middle income countries and that's obviously very important um and particularly also for the global fund we are still supporting you know about 120 countries around the world um and we are expecting that countries increase their own domestic funding that that is absolutely important trend but we also mm-hmm. have to differentiate between the diseases um the global fund uh, you know has the mandate to to fight aids tuberculosis and malaria for aids mm-hmm. and tuberculosis you have by now the majority of all people affected by the diseases are in middle income countries that's not quite the same for malaria we have to recognize that malaria is still predominantly in low income countries and mm-hmm. um while we do want to encourage the countries to take greater responsibility and increase their domestic funding absolutely essential we we cannot neglect also particularly at this point in time the international solidarity aspect mm-hmm. um we have to recognize malaria for decades was basically a neglected disease there was hardly any international investment in in malaria Mm-hmm. um when we had already simple tools like like vet nets and uh, treatment that was not very expensive but there was no investment that changed basically with the creation of the global fund in 2002 the global fund has invested more than 9 billion dollars into malaria control efforts with the effects that that we have uh, discussed um and we also have to recognize there's often you know a lot of pessimism about uh, you know international funding for global health it is true that it has you know after what we call the golden decade you know tremendous increase in international funding between 2000 and mm-hmm. 2010 in recent years it has also stalled but it has not necessarily gone down um it has been more or less stable um and mm-hmm. we have at the same time countries particularly in asia latin america eastern europe who used to you know receive funding from the international community they are now transitioning out of international support which means on the other hand you concentrate more on uh, the mm. poorest country um mm. if we want to reverse this trend that we are seeing in malaria right now um we need more investments in malaria um i think part of the reason why we have seen not a further decrease and why we are off track is also that um you know basically at the moment malaria international malaria funding is stable it doesn't mean it has gone down necessarily mm-hmm. but but we need mm-hmm. now to redouble our efforts that's the kind right. of challenge of the day i believe right. and secondly you're right we are now in the era of the sustainable development goals um we have the goal of universal health coverage i think it's it's an absolutely vital goal it's fantastic that we have this framework 
and the Global Fund operates within that framework. We are currently working with WHO and other partners on an action plan towards achieving SDG 3. I think that is absolutely exciting. Um, you know, many people mm -hmm. who have seen the recent Economist, you know, cover page on, on universal health coverage. This is the time now for the world to invest in, in, in health. Um, it's, it's a great development. So indeed, we are operating within that framework. But it also sometimes is portrayed as if universal health coverage is something completely different from investing, for example, in malaria, which I would not agree with at all. Um, the challenge is that 20 years ago, there was no coverage with malaria services at all. Um, I've been working in many of the uh, poorest countries at that time, and we didn't. The people didn't have access even to the simple tools of, of mosquito nets because nobody invested in that. That is also part of universal health coverage. And mm -hmm. with the help of the international community, we've increased that coverage, which is great. And this needs to continue. Um, mm -hmm. We want to have full coverage. You know, every mm -hmm. person, every family should have access to an insecticide-treated bed net. Every person in a kind of uh, endemic malaria area should have access to diagnosis and treatment of malaria. And mm -hmm. it's not very complicated. You don't need very sophisticated health systems to implement that. So I would see this absolutely within the frame of universal health coverage, within the frame of community system strengthening, health system strengthening. But when the GLOW Fund was created in 2002, basically the decision was, we are not waiting for health systems to be perfect before we start, you know, programs that, that mm -hmm, can improve mm -hmm. the health of people. Right. Now, I think that's true today. Um, we, we need to invest in health systems. We do invest in health systems. But at the same time, we want to kind of achieve coverage for all health problems, for infectious diseases, you know, non-communicable diseases, and so on. And, and the Globe Fund mm -hmm. is playing its part um, in the communicable diseases, you know, area. Um, okay. So that's that's where we see that. And by the way, also, we, we've been investing in many of the health systems like procurement supply chain, um, community health systems, um, which is not, of course, only, uh, you know, supporting malaria programs. It is integrated right. and we need to integrate that more and more. If we are investing in, you know, community health workers, health extension workers, they do provide the malaria services, but they provide all the other services as well. And that's mm -hmm. where we have to go, I think. We are yeah. investing yeah. in these systems, we are improving access to these services, and by doing so, we are increasing universal health coverage and, you know, services that are affecting the, the population at large. I think that's a very relevant uh, point that you raise. As you mentioned, there are many countries that are transitioning out of uh, support, uh, being eligible for support from the Gavi and Global Fund and so on, uh, and for mm -hmm. World Bank loans, um, uh, World Bank grants for that matter. And so what we need to really see now is an increased domestic investment in health. Mm -hmm. And as you know, the WHO has put out a call for universal health coverage and has asked leaders of countries all over the world to commit domestic resources so that um, all citizens get covered with the basic package of health services. I can tell you, um, I've just returned from the Democratic Republic of Congo on a visit to the Central African Republic along with um, WHO DG Dr. Tedros. And we essentially went to see the response to Ebola in Equatorial province. Um, but also what the preparedness is like in the surrounding uh, countries like Central African right. Republic. And while there's been a tremendous uh, response on the ground to the Ebola outbreak uh, this time with WHO and all partners really coming together to mount a very speedy and effective response, what you see in the same district is a complete absence of any kind of basic primary health care services. Mm -hmm. So while the survival rate from Ebola this time has been good, and because of the vaccination campaign, the secondary cases have really, I think, uh, been reduced, people in that area are still suffering and dying from diseases like malaria and tuberculosis and other infectious uh, diseases. Mm -hmm. So I think we cannot talk anymore about interventions for specific diseases mm -hmm. 
without talking about universal health coverage. If the primary health care center does not have the rapid diagnostic test for malaria, they don't have anti-malarials and paracetamol and so on, um, it's unlikely that, that they will have the, the medicines or diagnostics for other common diseases. Mm -hmm. And it, it's also going to be very difficult to just focus on putting in um, malaria diagnostics and treatment without really thinking about what the other common infections are. So I think this is the reality that, you know, half the world still lacks access to basic and essential health services and that 100 million people are being pushed into poverty every year because they have to buy these services, which are often right. inappropriate and incorrect. And so I think we really, when we now um, talking about low and lower middle income countries, we have to really talk about universal access to basic services. And this will, you know, depend on the context. But certainly in majority of the countries, we're talking about malaria as an important cause of of uh, mortality and uh, and mortality, and so it has to be seen as part of this package right. of services, which have more increasingly have to be provided through domestic financing. You mentioned uh, integration, and thankfully we seem to be past that debate of vertical or yeah. horizontal programs. Um, but how do you think we're doing that? What we're doing with that in terms of integration of malaria in particular with health systems. Uh, so that you know, and vice versa, so they can you know, be uh, acting yeah. in synergy. Yeah, I think we have made great progress here. We are not talking about separate, you know, programs. Uh, we are we're talking about national health plans, national health strategies. And when the Global Fund supports countries financially, we are supporting them to implement their national strategies. There, there is no kind of Global Fund or WHO or anybody else's malaria strategy. It's part of a national strategy. That's what we are investing in. Mm -hmm. And it has been maybe a long journey, if you like. And, and you know, people also in ministries and so on had to learn how to integrate all these programs. And it's not, not perfect. I'm not pretending it, it's, it's perfect mm -hmm. yet. But we are certainly encouraging countries to have integrated health plans and then present to us what are the financial gaps? What are you covering from your domestic funding? Um, are you using your own resources? And then present to us what is the gap? And we can consider the gap, but it's mm -hmm. always part of a national plan. And the more you integrate, let's say, child health services overall with malaria program, the better for, for, for the health of, of the population and for achieving the full sustainable development goal three. Uh, healthy lives and well-being at all ages and malaria is part of that in many countries an important part of that in mm -hmm. other countries less so but but uh, absolutely we are supporting integration and that's the way to go for the future i think that uh, there's been a, a lot of uh, work done in this in this area and most countries i think are integrating malaria services you know community health workers being provided with rapid diagnostic tests, um, as well as with uh, essential medicines to treat uh, right. to treat malaria, and uh, and also the uh, sort of integrated uh, community care management uh, approaches, which look at uh, management of uh, fever in a child. Uh, so that includes the other important causes of fever, like pneumonia and uh, and other infections. Um, you know, I think more and more we're also waking up to the fact that we haven't focused on diagnostics as part of the package of care services. And th this became obvious, of course, many years ago when RTTs were introduced. It became clear that uh, not all fever is malaria and that there was a lot of over-diagnosis and over-treatment going on. But what we're seeing even in countries like India where uh, the, there have been projects putting diagnostics in place in primary health care centers, you can actually begin to make diagnosis of common infections. Of course, many of them are viral, like influenza and dengue, but also mm -hmm. cell infections like scrub typhus in some uh, uh, places and, and, and malaria and the other common infections. So I think it's, <clears throat> as we think about essential services, we have to think about diagnosis, diagnostics. And for the first time, WHO has put out a list of essential diagnostic right. tests. Uh, right. you know, almost 40 years after the first essential medicines list 
right. put out by WHO. So I think this uh, hopefully is going to lead to countries making uh, national lists of essential diagnostics, which could be put at different levels at primary health care level as well mm -hmm. as secondary yeah. and uh, tertiary level hospitals. Right. And right. I think that that will help. Uh, that will help you know appropriate right. uh, management. But I think that's it is, that's the way to to proceed, really, with malaria being integrated as one of the essential uh, services to be provided as part of a, a package right. of interventions. Right. One of the uh, one of the main rationales for this forthcoming malaria congress that's happening in in Melbourne at the beginning of July is to bring together the different sectors that need to be involved in this. So you know the policymakers, the researchers, the communities, yeah. and so on. Um, are you also having a feeling of deja vu going back to 20 years ago in the first HIV conferences? And what are some of the lessons from the HIV mobilization that we can use to jumpstart the, you know, the malaria elimination? Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I, I have that. And those of us who have been part of this movement, if you like, um, you know, the AIDS movement, um, that really was driven by people living with and affected by this disease. And then mm -hmm. from, you know, the first, you know, go, it was a multi-sectoral response. Governments, civil society, people affected by the disease, private sector, multilateral partners. That was mm -hmm. quite unique. And um, the, the challenge in malaria uh, was that there was no community as it was for, for, for the AIDS response. In a sense, you know, it was almost like an artifact that when the GLOW Fund was created um, in 2001, the tuberculosis and malaria, you know, fortunately were added to uh, the mandate of the GLOW Fund, although there was no kind of community behind, um, like in the, in the AIDS movement. Malaria is mainly affecting children and they don't have that much of a lobby. But mm. what we've seen over the years is that there has been a tremendous increase in the number of NGOs working on malaria, <clears throat> international organizations working on malaria. It's not just, you know, WHO and RBM and, and, and the Global Fund. There, there are mm -hmm. many organizations now engaged in malaria. So that's clearly new. Mm -hmm. um, also, the engagement of the private sector. Um, we, we didn't have that for, for many years. But, but we see now that the private sector is really taking great interest in malaria mm -hmm. control. Mm -hmm. Partly because they see that malaria is also affecting their business. I mean, if you are looking at uh, companies that have major investments in, in, in Africa, for example, um, they realize that has an economic effect on their business, similar to the response to the AIDS you know, epidemic um, uh, about 20 years ago. When mm. you put all this is not just a human tragedy, but this has economic consequences for countries and for companies. Mm -hmm. that, that's mm -hmm. Also with with malaria, um, and now new initiatives like the M2030 um, initiative that will be uh, publicized, you know, around the Melbourne conference is a fantastic example of that. That companies mm -hmm. are coming together, saying this is you know important for us. We are lending not only our financial resources that is very important, but also raising awareness um, about malaria, reaching out to the community. Mm -hmm. Um, that's something that we hadn't seen for, for many years in the malaria community, and we are seeing that now. So it's very encouraging, I think, uh, to see that. And the Melbourne Congress will be maybe even the first one that brings together all these, you know, stakeholders in, in a way that reminds many people of the, you know, AIDS conferences and then the kind of early days of the AIDS movement. Well, I think HIV and malaria are very different uh, uh, diseases. Um, the main one being that HIV is a chronic infection and once you're infected, you're infected for life, you're living with the infection for life and have to deal with a range of uh, issues, uh, including, uh, you know, your ability to work and to mingle with people in your marriage and, and sexual life and having children and stigma and society and a number of right. things. So malaria is very different because it's it's an acute infection and, and you can be treated and, and then you live a normal life and, and there's, there's no real stigma associated with it. The other major difference is that malaria today affects 
mostly vulnerable and marginalized populations. They are either living in remote, forested areas, uh, mostly rural or tribal, um, far right. away from the urban centers where you know the decision makers live. And in fact, a disease like dengue gets much more attention, even though it's also a mosquito-borne disease, because it right. tends to affect urban areas. It tends to affect uh, right. classes of uh, society. Whereas HIV affected um, people at, again at different uh, different social strata, including the very well educated um, and well informed sections of society, and and therefore they were able to launch a kind of movement um, that really uh, helped to push the agenda, uh, both in terms of research and development of new tools mm -hmm. for HIV, but also the human rights agenda. Uh, that unfortunately has not happened for diseases like malaria and tuberculosis, uh, which have been traditionally neglected and diseases of the poor and the marginalized. So while I think it's really important that people realize uh, that, that civil society really comes together to, in a strong voice, um, this is true for other neglected diseases as well, and it's been traditionally very difficult to mobilize that kind of global support. It's happening for TV right. now. We have the UN high-level uh, meeting coming up in September where world leaders will actually talk about the burden of TB and commit to right. ending uh, TB as a public health disease. And I hope that similarly we can come together for malaria. Uh, we, we do need voices, I think, outside the medical community talking about the burden of malaria and why uh, we should still lose half a million women and children and men to malaria in this, in this day and age. Right. So I, right. I feel it is a challenge and I think the big differences between HIV and malaria, it's not easy to learn the same lessons, but we still need to think about a way of mobilizing civil society. Is ending malaria uh, an aspirational goal or is it going to be the next polio, as some people are calling it? Can we truly rid the world of this disease in the next decade or so? What's your view? It is certainly an aspirational goal, but we also know that we have to be careful with our definitions and how we present this. Mm -hmm. um, so to be precise, we are talking about ending malaria as an epidemic. We, we are not talking about the eradication of malaria. So therefore, it's not the new polio. Um, that is not possible with the current tools. We don't have a vaccine that is 100%, you know, effective. Yeah. And we would need that, you know, hopefully one day we'll get to that, that, that we can set the goal of eradicating malaria. But that's not the current goal. The goal is elimination um, in more and more countries. And we've seen uh, that, that increasingly countries are able to eliminate malaria. Sri Lanka is a fantastic example of, of that, um, where malaria was very prevalent. The Global Fund uh, you know, supported Sri Lanka over many years. Um, and now it has been declared you know, malaria-free, fantastic achievement. So elimination mm -hmm. is possible. We want to increase the number of countries that can eliminate. But globally, we have to be realistic. Uh, we want to reduce the current burden by, by 90%. We are mm -hmm. not on track to achieve that right now. We want to get back on track. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but eradication is, is something different. And that's something um, you know, very important about these goals. They have to be ambitious, but they also have to be achievable because otherwise mm -hmm. the community will easily get disillusioned and disappointed if they see, no, this is, this is not realistic. Mm -hmm. So. Um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's exactly the right way how to talk about that. And I'm sure the, the Congress in Melbourne will address uh, this question. How can we shrink the malaria map? How can we eliminate malaria from more and more countries? And we also need to invest in new tools and better tools. Um, we have the challenge of increasing you know, in, in insecticide resistance. Um, and we need investments in, in new insecticides. We need investments mm -hmm. in new drugs. And we also need investments in improving the current vaccine that, that, that we, together with other partners, are testing in a couple of countries. But that needs to be refined and improved to become the really impactful tool that we hope it will become. Well, yes, the, the, it's a very ambitious uh, goal, but I would say that it's achievable. Uh, 
and it is evidence-based. Um, uh, the definition of uh, the global targets for 2030 included reduction in malaria incidence and malaria mortality by, by over 90%. So it's, we are really right. talking about elimination as a, as a public health uh, problem and as a major cause of uh, mortality. Mm -hmm. uh, it also includes the elimination of malaria in about 35 countries and preventing of the re-establishment of malaria in countries which have already um, declared elimination. And we, right. we, we see countries like Venezuela where the public health system collapses. You get a resurgence of diseases like measles, malaria, and then all right. the other infectious diseases which you think you have. Uh, so it's not only important to achieve that elimination, but also to, to be able to maintain it. Right. Uh, WHO had set up a scientific advisory group on the on malaria eradication, the SAGE, which is considering the... the options, um, what would need to be done to, to eradicate malaria globally, um, what the uh, you know, practical timelines would be, and also what the cost mm -hmm. um, or the bill would be to achieve something like that. We have a broad range of uh, scientists and experts, including economists, working on this, and they will then report to the DG uh, within the next uh, 6 to 12 months about what it would take for the world to eradicate malaria and also, you know, practical uh, sort of their inputs on whether it's uh, achievable uh, and, and what the potential strategies uh, would need to mm. be. So yeah. I would say that um, polio is different because polio eradication means, you know, getting rid of every last case of polio from the world, and getting rid right. of the virus basically circulating uh, among humans. Now, where, we're not talking about similar thing for for malaria because presumably the Anopheles mosquito will continue to be around and um, perhaps the parasite as well. But it would be at such a low uh, rate, the parasite burden, that it wouldn't be a big public health problem. Right. Of course, now we can even dream about you know getting rid of mosquito species as a whole through using gene drive and uh, other such technologies. Right. Right. Uh, but there's, of course, still a lot of debate about whether something like that uh, is technically, but also morally and ethically doable. And, and whether right. we should proceed down that road is something that scientists and others, ethicists need to debate and discuss. But mm -hmm. it's potentially on the horizon. And if you get rid of the vector, then presumably you can get rid of uh, malaria as you know, permanent. Right. 